Hey, uh, thanks for having me. I'm here to talk about timeless analysis uh, at the virtual machine level and whether or not it could be applied uh, to malware analysis. So my name is Matthew Favreau. I'm a software engineer at Etrain, so I'm absolutely not a reverse engineer. So I'm not an authority on the subject. And uh, rather, I'm here to talk about um, discussions we've had with our users and uh, about whether or not this kind of technology could be applied to malware. And uh, my goal here is to share with you this kind of uh, this output and maybe generate um, ideas, discussions, and we'd love to hear about them if that's okay. Uh, obviously, Tetrain's not the only player in town. Uh, WinCT and Mozilla are, 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 are the, I guess, the most uh, known product today. Uh, although they do work at the processor level and what we talked about here is going to be uh, about applying that at the virtual machine level. Uh, so, so everyone's on the same page, uh, timeless debugging. The idea is that you record something like a process um, and then you debug that afterwards. So you get the trace and you get all the states uh, of at any moment in time. So you can debug forward or you can step backwards as well. And um, on top of that, you can build tools. Uh, obviously, you can aggregate data so that it's easier to see or understand. And you can build indexes so that data is faster to access when you do your analysis. Um, again, we apply that to the virtual machine inside of the process. So uh, on top of that, you also get the kernel memory. You can debug um, kernel processes, uh, drivers, obviously, things like that. And also, you can follow data through system calls, and that's that might be relevant in certain times. Um, of course, what's different um, with uh, Sandbox and Live VMB debugging, uh, the, the information you can get is slightly different. Uh, first of all, the analysis won't affect the running system because you're running them afterwards, so you can take your time. Um, of course, um, it's the recording environment is still easily detectable by by the malware, um, so you need to work around that. You get access to everything. If you need to go to the past, you don't need to restart your process. You just go back to the start of your trace and you get the information, so the contacts don't change, um, the addresses don't change, nothing changes. Um, and What's really interesting here is that you basically you can get answers about what happened in the past from a certain moment that you're interested in and like who wrote that or who reset that pointer or these kind of things. Um, and you can link data like encrypted blocks back to the uh, non-encrypted block. So basically you get a trace and you get two tools on top of it so that you can connect moments of that trace. All right, so um, to be more, uh, to give examples of what we think we can do with it, um, basically, um, the first thing you could do is log strings. Um, and I'm talking about dynamic strings. Like, if you look at all the memory accesses in your trace, and uh, you, when something looks like a string, you log that in a database. Then if the malware starts to decrypt some string in memory, use that and erase it afterwards. It doesn't matter because uh, as soon as it hits memory, uh, well, it's there in your database for the analyst to use. So it's pretty convenient. So that makes it easy to extract uh, like encrypted URLs or things like that that your malware has used in your trace. Obviously, the challenge here is to make sure your malware uses it. Uh, the second example we have is encrypted data. Like if you have something, you don't necessarily need to decrypt it because you can hopefully link it back to the original block. Uh, the idea here is that you look at memory accesses, the reason writes, and you try to understand what your program does, uh, and you move backwards uh, either manually or automatically, and that's a tainting engine, that's what it does for you. And maybe you can link that to the source, and if you can, uh, it makes things like having an encrypted uh, packet sent to the CNC uh, easier to connect to the data, and maybe you can identify what data was exfiltrated, was exfiltrated or maybe what CNC command was sent, or these kind of things. And that's where having the kernel memory is really useful, because you can link data even if it goes to system goals, like uh, if the data is going through a name pipe or going via a shared memory from one process to another or these kind of things, it's, make, it's actually possible to trace it. Whereas if you only had one process, you would, be, you would hit the roadblock there. Uh, and the third example is defeating patterns. There was actually a, a workshop this morning about, about that by uh, Benoit Stevens. Um, and the idea is... Um, Using the, taint, uh, using the timeless analysis, you can find where your malware is executing, and when you do, uh, other, it's already convenient to dump there, and or um, it's not, and then you can again apply the tainting engine and trace that data all the way back to the original packer. And when you do that, uh, it makes it fairly easy, or at least easier, to see all the stages 
that led to this binary being dumped. And um, maybe along the way, there's a moment where dumping the binary is more practical because maybe, I don't know, it was extracted as a resource from the file. Or, or maybe you find all the new binaries that are involved in this stage and you can apply the same process again and dump them and at the end you get everything and you can load that in IDA and, and do your usual, th usual stuff. Uh, as a conclusion, I would say that, um, so we do timeless debugging it. Maybe it could be used more when uh, analyzing malwares. Uh, at least that's our question today. Uh, and uh, hopefully, if you have ideas, we'd, we'd absolutely love to hear about, about what you think about this. Um, thanks. Hey, thank you.